So this month we have covered ambiguity in Halloween and random violence in Strangers, but I said that this week we would look at a film where that cold Frankenstein unexplained demeanor that was exhibited by those killers was totally lost to a much more generic humanized portrayal of a psychotic killer. Many of you have guessed and I have been sent way more personal messages than I care to imagine. So yeah, of course, why wouldn't we talk about Scream? Scream is the horror movie's horror movie. It's one of those films that works on its own as a conventional high quality slasher flick, but it's the heavy use of satire towards cliches common throughout the genre that makes it infinitely better. I'd be lying if I said I entirely got it the first time around, it took a very long time to grow on me, as the more knowledgeable you are in terms of horror movies, the more subtle and surprising the meta production becomes, like Drew Barrymore getting the Marion Crean treatment, or having Jimmy Kennedy shout look behind you Jimmy at Jimmy Lee Curtis when there is a killer literally behind him as well. In the 90s, the influx of direct -to video releases and over-reliance on established franchises began to wear and tear the horror genre, as most of them practically did the same bloody thing. So naturally, Scream became the resurgence desperately needed to bring the slasher genre back to some essence of credibility, before the Blair Witch Project came and refined the entire horror genre three years later, but for very different reasons, you can watch my video on that. Yet, there was no denying its impact as it was effectively one of the pioneering films to call out the problem with every horror movie in existence, while also adding its own meta twist on the whodunit mystery thriller. Frankly, Scream became a prime example of pure horror satire. There is a misconception that satire equals comedy, which isn't entirely true. A satire critiques a subject matter by employing methods of irony, sarcasm, comparison, burlesque, and a little bit of caricature to make fun or ridicule the topic or idea in question. That was actually the problem getting many big name directors like Robert Rodriguez, Danny Boyle, George Romero, or Sam Raimi to sign up to the project. They all thought it was a comedy. But what makes it funny is two things, characters that are contextually funny and that they are just naturally funny people, and then there's the film's overt self-awareness that stops it from simply being a mimic of other horror movies, that's what a spoof does, no. and instead takes immense, if indeed derivative, influence from many iconic films to prove its point about the structure and functions of horror movies. Randy, the film's movie buff virgin comic relief, let's go with that, represents the mind of the film. He makes a point late into the movie about the formula, stating that basically everything the audience sees can be interpreted using horror movies to deduce what's going to happen. Kevin Williamson wrote the screenplay as a response to his fears of being attacked by an intruder after watching a series about the Gainesville Ripper, Danny Rowland, who murdered several college students at the turn of the 90s. Originally titled Scary Movie, not that scary movie, it became a love letter to the slasher genre that fundamentally understood horror conventions and the importance of a charismatic cast of lovable and despicable characters who were fleshed out, complex, and motivated in believable ways that when it came to the whodunit trope, it's genuinely unpredictable, at the same time, notably familiar. Everybody's a suspect! There is a lot I want to say about Scream, so basically I'm going to break this video into three parts. Motivation, representation, and temporal logic. That last one's a bit weird, but trust me, it'll make sense once we get to it. The motivation angle for the killers is interesting, because while it is undoubtedly simple, having studied minor psychology and still being high on my Mindhunter phase, the reasoning makes a very truthful and valid point about many serial killers. The twisted idea behind it is that there isn't a direct correlation given as to why they chose to be killers. Billy technically blames it on his mother's abandonment caused by Sydney's mother's affair with his father, and Stu, well, uh... Peer pressure. I'm far too sensitive. I'm gonna rip you up, you bitch! Don't get me wrong, Billy's motivation makes absolute sense, although contextually they both come off as rather shallow and unjustified. Fuck. But their sudden eagerness to commit murder isn't far off a lot of real psychopathic killers. 
it falls close to a thing in psychology called base rate fallacy, which is quantitative data that is used by criminal profilers to construct an image of the suspect. But really what it becomes is just random guesswork. It could be as ignorantly simple as, uh, oh, someone commits murder because they have family issues, or, you know, uh, someone stabbed somebody multiple times because they have clear anger issues. Really what it becomes is just a way of justifying why people go nuts. God damn it. The reality with Billy is that he's just a default psychopath and nothing more, and this becomes visually evident in how he gradually reduces his cold demeanour to pure lunacy by the end. Stu, on the other hand, who for me is probably the most interesting of the two, is just an idiot. My mom and dad are gonna be so it actually calls back to the Gainesville Ripper, this son of a bitch's twisted motive was to become a celebrity serial killer like Ted Bundy, but that's sort of the same angle that Billy and Stu are kinda going for. They want to be recognised as survivors who tragically but triumphantly overcame the killer in their own sensationalist way, which is ironic in the sequels now that they're technically famous but for very different reasons. The crazy point about Randy is that he bluntly points this out. The characters are in a world that acknowledges the existence of horror movies, and the killers are basing their logic entirely on it, hence consequences don't become a factor to them, they're merely living their own twisted fantasy. Killers in movies rarely consider consequences. You haven't thought of the smell, you bitch! So when they stab each other, they don't seem to account for the fact that they aren't invincible like Michael Myers or Jason or Freddy Krueger just to get a Wes Craven reference in there. The logic, or indeed the importance of motive, is summed up by Randy as... It's the millennium. Motives are incidental. Millennium? Hmm. Millennium, I like that. What he basically highlights is the crap I've been saying for the last two videos. The problem with motives is that if you get too complex, you lose your audience, hence the film itself doesn't dwell in attempting to justify its own psychology, and yet you still go along with it because it never indulges in its logic to the point that it becomes obvious. But there is more to Billy and Stu's logic as killers, which brings us to representation. The film makes a point to highlight them as having fundamentally contrasting behaviours, which makes guessing which killer is under the mask in each scene more interesting. For example, when attacking Sydney, he's very clumsy, so it's Stu, but when Casey is killed, it's clearly Billy because he's much more in control of the situation. However, this is very debatable given the plot information, but I'm not going to get into a friggin' who shot first argument over it. Serial killers play a game of dominance with their victims, something which Wes Craven distinctly explores in A Nightmare on Elm Street. And you can see how both Billy and Stu are in total opposites. Billy is driven by a frustrated motive, whereas Stu's immorality is summed up in his hilariously genuine peer pressure excuse. Hello? He's really just a minion to Billy, who has a greater sense of a relative rationale in his decision making, whereas Stu just acts instinctively without ever really thinking about it. Unlike Halloween and Friday the 13th, the killers are childish and immature and have Kruger-like fun taunting their victims, and in turn it truly humanises them by making them not comedically dumb but overeager and clearly on an adrenaline rush that they're both prone to stupid but understandable mistakes. Ultimately they're just everyday dudes, there is no implication they're trained or supernatural, they're just as humanly weak as the rest of us, and when Scream came about, rarely did a horror movie ever place emphasis on a killer's weakness, A Nightmare on Elm Street again being one of the more identifiable ones at the time. In fact, in this scene, the killer is caught by surprise by Tatum's defence, yet her attempt to escape becomes characterised by irrational and desperate but contextually appropriate thinking, allowing the killer to easily obtain the advantage when he was originally being defeated. The same goes for Sydney in this scene. She explains why she hates horror movies. No, just what's the point? They're all the same. Some stupid killer stalking some big-breasted girl who can't act who's always running up the stairs when she should be going out the front door. It's insulting. And when the killer chases her, she runs up the stairs doing the very thing she complained about. But again, it adds a rationale to decisions that in a bad horror movie would be seen as simply dumb. It's not so much desperation in this scene, but rather a reaction to not being able to unlock the door and trying to keep her distance from the killer. So when I was a filmmaker, the thing that I find most interesting about this film was its use of temporal logic, or the logic of time, if you want to be less pretentious about it. Uh, if you want the in-depth analysis to how time works in film, go read a collection of Sergei Eisenstein books on editing, but they're, they're a nightmare to translate, so go knock yourself out. Um, 
But what's most interesting about the film is, if you look at the climax, it's the way in which Wes Craven constructs an understanding of how information works in real time. Let me explain. Basically, like Williamson's script, Wes Craven's direction is deeply sophisticated because of how it lets you understand geography and time. Of course, there being two killers answers the question as to how they're able to surprise victims by being able to abruptly Michael Myers their way around the setting, but more so, small plot points like killing Principal Fonzie, a later addition to the script, gives the background characters a reason to exit the party to focus on the central characters. And the only reason Randy, who is technically the most insignificant character left, sticks around is because he naturally wants to watch the movie. The film establishes a distance between the house and the town where the police station and school are located, justifying the delay until the cops arrive and the ultimate departure of the party guests. While Billy remains in the room, Sydney discovers Tatum's corpse at the back of the house, hence why nobody discovered the body potentially hours before now. The killer being able to get from the house to the van to make a surprise kill so fast is justified by the broadcast delay on the camera established by Kenny, manipulating our understanding of the real-time events. As Sydney escapes to the field, this gives the killer a reason to go back to the house to kill Randy, who by this point has already left to find everyone, while Dewey enters the house alone and alternates as the new victim after Gale is made unconscious by crashing into the tree where Randy is present. Then, seeing the killer eventually run off after Sydney locks herself in the police car, we have Randy now appear clearly injured from the fall caused by Gale in the van further down the road, and of course, Stu comes back from where the killer supposedly ran off to, now covered in sweat, reinforcing him as the killer considering the killer already knew perfectly how to navigate Stu's house to begin with. It's so obvious and the flow is invisible to the audience, but you can certainly appreciate the meticulous choreography in the visual storytelling in this climax. As simplistic as the sequence of events are, they all serve to reinforce how and why things happen in the order that they do. And it's not the only good example. When the killer is chasing Sydney earlier in the film, having Billy appear almost immediately after the killer runs away establishes an alibi both in terms of the story to throw distrusted Billy and ultimately take it away, and also to keep the audience guessing because of the abnormal relation given to time and location. In such a grounded world, it's impossible for Billy to get from here to here in a matter of seconds. The same immediacy happens when the killer rings Sydney after Billy is in jail, only to hang up very briefly before Dewey arrives to answer the dead phone, subtly making him a suspect in the process because of the timing between the phone call ending and Dewey entering the frame. The film absolutely contextualizes time in relation to how the characters move around the filmic space, but it also uses time as a means of escalation. Okay, let's look at the opening scene. This harmless prank call goes on until 2 minutes and 30 seconds into the film when this happens. Why do you want to know my name? I want to know who I'm looking at. We go from prankster to stalker and exactly one minute later we get this. Asshole. No, you listen, you little bitch. If you hang up on me again, I'll cut you like a fish, understand? Now we go from stalker to killer in a faster rate of time to establish urgency. Within 30 seconds, she's locked the doors and the suspense dies down to indicate a sense of safety, but literally 15 seconds later, we have this line. What do you want? To see what your insides look like. And in just slightly less than 10 seconds, the doorbell rings. It's a pretty intense and detailed two minutes of building the threat from one spectrum to the other. That gradual deconstruction of the caller and the deteriorating emotional state of Casey is carried by those seamless beats of real-time storytelling. And what unfolds from there is immensely more unpredictable. And once we get that aggressive tracking shot of Casey's corpse, it doesn't matter how funny you assume the film to be, your expectations are already subverted by a horror scene that is retrospectively crafted and controlled by the two horror movie obsessed killers. I know a lot of people are going to ask about the sequels. I don't really like them. Uh, I, I think the second one is just okay, but really I don't think this series had the charm to sustain itself for multiple films. Um, really, what happens with a lot of satire is the more prolonged it becomes, eventually at some point you become the very thing that you are a satire of. 
which is a shame, and really it becomes a vicious cycle then on that you just really kind of skip. Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at a film that brings this month full circle, uh, something that explores one of the most iconic ideas, and that is how a serial killer's reign of terror becomes an absolute unflinching nightmare. You've worked this one out already. Hey folks, thanks for watching. Uh, just look above me. You see the several names that are right above me? Uh, I've had an influx of patrons recently and that is absolutely uh, heartwarming and has really made me the happy camper for the last couple of days. Uh, as you know, uh, AdSense revenue has plummeted and all uh, the whole ad apocalypse and copyright claims, etc, etc. So if you want to help support the channel and want me to keep making videos, uh, please do consider supporting me on Patreon. It's totally free will, uh, but it really does help us a lot. Um, we get to the $200 goal. We're starting a new show that's going to be bi-weekly, so keep it tuned for that. And we also have a podcast, which I'm trying to work out the logistics of, and once I get that, I will uh, let you all know. Uh, anyway, guys, until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you all very soon. Thanks. Bye!